I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of the Tech Field Day event series. What you're about to watch is a presentation from Tech Field Day Live at NetApp Insight. Tech Field Day is an event where we bring independent writers, speakers, bloggers, podcasters together with companies in their space to ask questions, interact, discuss, and of course, to learn about new technology. If you'd like to learn more, you can come to techfieldday.com and you can see a lot of videos like this at youtube.com slash techfieldday. Thanks for watching. My name is John Fulbright. I'm the principal technical architect within the cloud business unit at NetApp. Uh, I don't present that often, and you'll usually find me in a lab somewhere. But I'm here today to talk people. about NetApp Private Storage. Okay, what I, what I wanted to talk about today was some of the enterprise uses, why enterprises use NetApp Private Storage, um, where you can use MPS, it's not available in all locations, so where can you use it? Um, MPS for cloud networking, I'll do a little bit of a deep dive on that. How do you wire it together? Um, what's different about it from what other people do? Uh, how to move your workloads from on-prem to the cloud? We'll use an example of VMware to AWS. And uh, testing uh, uh, NetApp private storage for cloud with NetApp uh, Cloud Lab. NetApp Cloud Lab is a site that we have set up where you can request a POC, you bring your own cloud account, we'll provide the storage and you can try it out. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to talk about one of our recent customers, which was Technology One in Australia. They're a service provider who has a storage as a service offering. They were looking at doing this. They want to offer their customers the ability to connect to not just one cloud, but multiple clouds without having to, for them, the provider, having to build multiple infrastructures, one for each cloud. So they uh, took a look at the MPS solution. This is what they deployed. They actually offer storage as a service. You can go to them and you can buy storage by the drink. And uh, some of the key points were that they, uh, they moved about 1.2 petabytes of, of existing storage from where they were doing it in hyperscale cloud providers into the solution. They, uh, uh, the solution is based on cloud on tap, or uh, clustered data on tap, CDOT, and it uses Metro cluster across two locations. So it has extreme high availability in, in uh, to reduce the number of outages for customers. And it also includes some other components. They have uh, the vaulting, the cloud, they have vault to vault and some other pieces here. Uh, some of the benefits were that they were able to reduce their cost of the solution by 9.8 million Australian. Over three years, um, they were able to leverage our deduplication and compression and snapshots and, and all of the other wonderful things that CDOT provides. So why MPS for the cloud? Why do customers want to do this? Well, 80% of all enterprises um, will commit to, to hybrid cloud <clears throat> architectures by 2017, and this is based on both IDC and Gartner studies, which you'll see footnoted at the bottom. 78% <coughs> of enterprises consider, are considering uh, ma managing that data across multiple clouds. So what we really see is that customers are deploying not just in one cloud, they're deploying in many clouds. They're deploying in private clouds on-prem, they're deploying in virtualization on-prem, they're deploying in um, hosted uh, private clouds and hosting providers, and they're deploying in one or more public clouds. So some of the issues um, when dealing with uh, working in the public cloud that come up most often with customers and their issues that this solution addresses are data sovereignty, multi-cloud choice, and performance. So with data sovereignty, oftentimes what happens is uh, in EMEA or even in the United States or in Australia, there's rules and regulations for certain industries about where you can put your data. Uh, in EMEA, certain, class, uh, certain categories of data have to exist within that country. In the United States, we have a thing called ITAR data, and ITAR data has specific boundaries of where that data can actually reside. Australia is very much the same way. Canada is probably the most restrictive, by the way. Uh, Multi-cloud. Uh, 
The point here is to avoid lock-in. Customers look at these cloud providers and without a solution like this, if I want to go to Amazon, that means I have to move all of my data into the Amazon cloud. And when you deal with the hyperscale cloud providers, for the most part, ingress data, that means when you put data in, well, there's no bandwidth charges. But when it comes time to take that data out, there are bandwidth charges and they can be quite significant. And the last one is performance. So if you've uh, worked with Amazon Object Storage S3, uh, you, you kind of know what the performance envelope of that is. It's really designed about time to first byte and throughput, not really what we consider in a POSIX application world. In POSIX, POSIX applications, we're worried about IOPS and latency. Um, the levels of storage you can get in various clouds, whether it's Amazon or whether it's Azure or whether it's software, um, vary. <laughs> so anywhere, anywhere from 10, 20, 30 milliseconds down to say, GP2 storage in Amazon, which is a couple milliseconds for a limited number of IOPS, depending on what you bought. Um, so all of these things play on people that go and, and want to put applications in the cloud. Uh, when we look at data sovereignty issues, as, as I just discussed, you know, it's all about location, it's all about governance, it's all about regulation. In a lot of cases, uh, our Australian friends, for example, they have to prove to the regulating inventory uh, authorities where my data is. They have to physically be able to go into a data center and point to a device and say, my, is it, my data is right there. If they don't do that, they can't put it in the cloud. A question on that. If I'm using the data in the servers themselves and they're pulling in the storage from NPS storage into the servers that are in EC2, isn't that data now in the cloud? No, because there's persistent storage and there's a ephemeral storage. So when you pull the data across to do compute, that's ephemeral storage, and when you, when you kill the instance, it's gone. It it's doesn't cached, last. It's cached, it's still ephemeral? Mm -mm. So in the major cloud providers, the design of the compute layer destroys, the, destroys or overwrites all the storage when you shut that instance off. So it's gone. And that's by design, it's done on purpose, because once you shut that off, customer number two can come along and power up a, a AMI instance or a Azure VM right on that same compute. You don't want them to be able to see the storage you had before there. So that's, that's the concept of ephemeral storage is it doesn't last and it's completely gone when you power it off. So the, there is a, uh, another factor and that is the encryption of data. Hmm. And a lot of folks, especially when you're dealing in an ITAR or, or a, a GovCloud or FedRAMP type certification area, we worry about encryption of the data in transit, and we worry about the encryption of the, of the data at rest. Hmm. But on the actual compute, that's ephemeral. It, it goes away when you turn it off. So the other thing is multi-cloud. You've probably seen quite a few, well, starting with hyperscale cloud providers, if I'm Amazon, what storage am I gonna offer you? I'm going to offer you Amazon storage. If I'm Azure, I'm going to offer you Azure storage. If I'm software, I'm gonna offer you software storage and Google and so on and so on. Customers have become wise to that lock-in. And even though it's free to put your data in the cloud, ingress bandwidth is free. It's not free to store it at rest, but it's free to get it there. It's not free to take it out of the cloud. There are egress data charges. There's charges to pull your data out of the cloud. Uh, customers want choice. They don't want to be locked in and be at the mercy of the, of the vendors. They want to be able to move things around to whatever fits their budget and their um, requirements, requirements in terms of space and performance and all of those things. So when we look at moving data and how that works, and you, and you may recognize this because one of, one of your brethren here is here at the show actually did this study. Um, the solution we have here with, with NetApp private storage offers some advantages. S data, where compute is, is ephemeral, Data is not. Compute, you know, I need the compute, I power it up, I turn it on, I use it, I don't need it, I turn it off. 
it doesn't quite work that way with storage. You know, if I need a terabyte of storage and I'm done uh, doing my work here, generally I don't turn it off and wipe the terabyte of storage. I, uh, the whole point of storage is to store that data. Storage is du durable, compute is ephemeral. So the problem becomes now, uh, when I want to take my workload from one place to another, I have to move that data to go with it. And this study was really around the time it takes to move data. And in the NPS solution, what we really do is we put storage close to the cloud with low latency, high bandwidth connectivity. And that means that we provide some advantages on the time it takes to move data from point A to point B. However, the fastest way you can move data is don't move it at all. And that's what, the, with multi-cloud, that's what this solution provides. You have the ability to put some data on a mount point, you know, mount it from a compute instance in one cloud. If you decide you don't want to run your compute in that cloud, dismount it and mount it on a compute instance in another, it takes about four seconds. No matter what the size of your data, it could be hundreds of terabytes, it takes the same amount of time because it's only the mount and dismount time. Where the solution resides, you know, it's where do you put your storage? Well, you put it, in, you put it in a cloud data center that's co-located or, or reasonably close to the points of presence for the hyperscale cloud providers you're interested in. We have a, an alliance agreement with Equinix, a partnership, and we prefer to use the Equinix data centers. Um, they're a tier four data center. They have uh, physical, physical security constraints. They have uh, power, power generation, backup power generation. Um, they, they essentially have a high degree of operational redundancy as well as physical security. And here's a, a photo of one of the cages within an Equinix data center. I believe that particular one is SV5. We talk about customers that use this solution and deploy in the cloud. We have a wide variety of customers today that are using this solution from a wide variety of industries. Uh, in this particular slide, we talk about what the use case is, what are they using it for, uh, what's the vertical industry, who the compute provider is, who the VAR was. We have, a, we have a large number of VARs, MSPs, managed service providers, and resellers that help customers deploy and operate these solutions. So what, what's the benefit of <coughs> purchasing it, let's say, as a SKU versus doing it on your own? Because I was doing what, what ah. MPS well before. Okay, the there, there's two announcements sure. at this show, and you probably saw the one yesterday from Arrow. So when we're talking about purchasing it on a SKU. Mm. So if, I actually have some slides to cover this later in the okay. deck, but we'll talk about it quickly. Um, if I am a customer and I decide to do this myself without going through a partner, I have to negotiate with NetApp and I have to buy some gear, I have to get it scheduled, delivered, install it, you know, bring it up. Then I have to go out and coordinate with the colo and I have to spend six to nine months negotiating a contract for cage space, I have to get some cage space, I have to put in a smart hands request, I have some racks bolted to the floor, all of those things. And then I have to, to negotiate with a, with a cloud compute provider, and I have to have an account, figure out a payment method, whether it's gonna be credit card or whether it's gonna be invoice, or however I'm gonna do it. And then I have to uh, install and, and order, install, and configure the connectivity from my cage to wherever that provider's uh, point of presence is within that data center. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of activities that involve multiple vendors that if I myself am going to do it, that I, I'm responsible to do. If I go through a partner like Arrow uh, or Synoptic, I can order off of one SKU mm -hmm. and they will handle all that for me. And in a lot of cases, these partners will give me a, a monthly bill, an OPEX bill. So they'll turn my, whereas certain components like the cage space were OPEX all along and other components like a capital purchase of a, of a NetApp storage were not, they were CapEx, the, the partners will generally blend that all into an, a month by month OPEX based solution. So how does the, uh, typically one of the benefits of 
doing it on your own or a la carte is knowing every single neck that needs to be strangled in case something isn't right. When we're single skewing it through a distributor. Yeah, they're, they're tier one support. Mm. So, and then they, if it goes beyond two, they're the, they're the point that you call because they're the tier one support. And then if it gets escalated, they can escalate to us, they can escalate to the data center provider, or they can escalate to the cloud compute provider. Any other questions on this slide? Not particularly on this slide, but um, are there any uh, sort of hardware requirements, or could it be any NetApp box? Could it be an E-Series? Could it be a, you know, a FAS? You know? Today, <laughs> right, right this moment, what has been released so far is all FAS. Okay. So it's NetApp FAS. Does it have to be? No. Yes. Um, really make sense. Will there be other solutions in the future that involve other NetApp storage products? I'm certain there will. Yeah, maybe. Well, if we can't get down to one millisecond latency from the EC2 to the storage, obviously a lot of the yeah. benefits of us. Let me go look in the lab. Yeah, I'm sure there will be. So, <laughs> so we're we're going through the process of of doing other products, but you you understand that uh, you don't just say, oh, here's a solution, here's a product. You have to acquire the product. You have to put the product in the lab. You have to set it up. You have to test it. You have to document it. <coughs> do a TR. Yeah. So there's a whole process of things that have to happen to have that happen. But yeah, it will. So where is it available? Well, our, our alliance partner is, is Equinix, certainly all Equinix locations globally. It can be available and customers do use it out of other colo providers. I've seen multiple customers go out of switch, either Ultimo in Australia or, or SuperNAP in uh, Las Vegas. And it just really depends on connectivity, location, location, location. The whole point of the solution is to get you close to the cloud. So wherever that data center is, it has to be physically close enough to the cloud provider you're interested, the cloud compute provider that you're interested in using it. It has to be close enough to them to have low enough latency to make sense. It wouldn't make sense to use a data center in, you know, in, in uh, Minnesota, if your cloud compute provider was in Southern California. It just wouldn't make sense. It's physics, it's time. Yeah, since you brought up connectivity, I have on my screen, I brought up the Amazon Direct Connect fees because I know you have, we have to do Direct Connect from, as part of the NPS, we have to Direct Connect from the Colo. Yeah, well, this is, right? for Amazon, so the connectivity, what, they, what they're called for the three providers that we have published solutions for, so for Amazon, it is called Direct Connect. Right. For Azure, it's called Express Route. Express Route right. For IBM Software, it's called Direct Link. Right. But, but it's it, the same thing. It's yeah, but, high but speed my question is, so you know, from a budgeting perspective, not counting what, we, what anybody would pay NPS and would pay NetApp or you know, the, mm -hmm. the VAR selling through the distributor, there's a per gig charge of you know, between two and three cents per gig for data out. Out egress, that's right. right. But that's, that's from the EC2 to the storage. So um, how do you budget for that? Um, you know your workload. So one of the things I did last year is, is I did a bunch of testing around Oracle on AWS and Oracle on software and so forth using the MPS solutions. You, if you search for it, you can find the TRs that were published. In those, in those workloads, we knew that 20% uh, of our workload was going to be writes. And we knew how much data we were pushing. So we were able to estimate the, the egress bandwidth. Now from Amazon as a provider and Azure as a provider, you can actually go check your bill every single day. They're, up, they're updated daily. So you, you, can, you can use an estimation route or you can actually take samples and, and know over time how much you're using. You uh, want to know that up front though. Yeah, yes, you, you bring up a good point is you really need to know um, if you, what does your workload look like? It is, is it predominantly a read workload? Is it predominantly a write workload? What's the general size of the workload? So you know how much data you're. Are you guys providing tools around. to take a look at a workload and be able to estimate what a charge would be? Yeah, so it, it wouldn't shouldn't be hard to. Do. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not rocket science. I mean, I don't have to. I don't have to spend a six month engagement measuring every single workload. You just need to know generally. What is my workload? How big it is? What percentage is reads and what percentage is writes? And you can come up with, with a pretty close estimate of what your egress charges are going to be. Uh, 
So we talked about colo providers. Okay, uh, the the majority of the folks we see are are using Equinix. Um, Equinix has a, a kind of unique thing to them. They have what's called the cloud exchange. The cloud exchange is basically uh, enterprise class switching that with connections to multiple uh, uh, service providers or cloud providers or SaaS providers. And it has an API and a GUI interface that you can go in and dynamically stand up and stand down virtual circuits. So what happens with a, with a cloud exchange, if you're in an Equinix facility, I just do one pair of cross connects over to the cloud exchange and then I can do virtual circuits to any provider I want. Is that less reason to get the MPS from the one ski from the distributor? Uh, excuse me? Is that less reason to go direct for the one ski from the distributor and do it yourself? Uh, I'd say it's neutral. It's not really a reason less or a reason more. So general, generally, the the partner that would be doing the single SKU would know this. Mm -hmm. So it's a, are you going to do it or are they going to do it? The amount of work doesn't change. Now, with Amazon, it is a special case. With, with Azure, all connectivity up to the maximum bandwidth that you can that you can get over a circuit, which recently was was 10 gig, but I believe they just announced at Ignite that's going up. Um, so 10 gig circuits, and when you buy from Azure, they come in pairs. So you're actually buying a pair, but uh, that'll go through the cloud exchange. Software goes through the cloud exchange. Other future ones that we're looking at adding go through the cloud exchange. Amazon for whatever contractual reason they have with Equinix, if the bandwidth you're requesting is one gig or below, you can go through the cloud exchange. For the 10 gig circuits, it's a direct connect to Amazon, which means it's a physical cross connect from your cage to the Amazon point of presence within that, that uh, colo. Okay, we talk about Equinix because they're our, our alliance partner and the locations that they have um, this is all available. The deck will be available afterwards. We talk about uh, some of our customers, Ana, Anadarko. Uh, what the opportunity was, the customer value. Uh, why are people buying this? <laughs> you know, uh, the this was an interesting one. It was a project last year where we stood up a small amount of gear at all these different locations for Equinix and uh, we measured what the average latencies were, so you would know. And we did this for, this one's for AWS, and you can see we also included ITAR and GovCloud. Our, ITAR is a little bit different because ITAR data maps to specific data centers which aren't close to anything. <laughs> so. Well, it makes sense that the government would be slow. Yeah, so. The, uh, we did the same thing for, for um, uh, Azure, and we also measured that latency. And we actually, if you go to cloud.netapp.com, which is our, our portal, our public-facing portal, we have all of this information there and a bunch of videos on what to expect for latencies. These are what we measured last year. And this is, this is a diagram of what it typically looks like when you wire this thing together. Uh, on the bottom of the diagram, you can see you have, a, you have a cage. And in Equinix, there's two kinds of cages. There's a dedicated cage, which has a five rack minimum commit. And then there's a shared cage where you just get one rack in a cage that can have other customers in different racks in the same cage. So, and, and all the cages, you've been in those data centers, all the cages have locks on the front and the back, and then the, to even get in the cage, it's a hand scan. To get in the area where the cages are, it's a hand scan. To get into the man trap between the, between the security and the, the area where it is, it's another physical hand scan, and then, then you're out where the security guards are that check your ID and do your badges, and then it's another hand scan to get out of the building. So by the time you get to your cage and get in your cage, you've done a biometric scan five times. A lot of fun in Equinix to try to go to the bathroom. Yeah, well, actually, actually on the floor there, they actually have bathrooms. It makes it a little easier, but you get, you're only, there's only one hand scan. You got to get out of the kitchen. Or empty water so, bottles. And uh, you know, the way they do the hot aisle, cold aisle, that, that's a very frequent problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're working on the back of the rack. 
in the hot aisle, and you know, it's nice and warm and roasty toasty. You walk around to the front of the rap, oh, darn, I gotta go to the bathroom. But uh, that's just us old guys have that problem. But, uh, okay. God, you guys told me not to say anything stupid. All right. <laughs> All right. Here I go. But, um, but basically, you, you have your connectivity out, out through the cloud providers, either physically through a cross-connect, if you're doing a 10-gig connection to Amazon or something, or you do cross-connects to the cloud exchange and it's logical virtual circuits to all these other providers. Those come back to what's called the DMARC, which is this little patch panel that sits on the top of your rack. From the DMARC, you'll go into a switch. When the, cir when the, when the circuits come back, they're encapsulated on a VLAN. So, so every circuit, every virtual circuit that you have is encapsulated on a VLAN. So your top of rack switches have to support VLANs. The routing is done at layer three through BGP, so your, your switches will have to have like an L3 module and an enterprise license because they'll have to be able to support uh, BGP as well, border gateway patrol, or uh, protocol, border gateway patrol, that's weird. Yeah, the but, border uh, gateway patrol is different. Yeah, I know, border They're patrol is in Arizona. No, no, all those states, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, right? But, uh, <laughs> but it's a border gateway protocol is what you use. In our solution, what we do is at the switch, we also have support for VRF Lite. And what that does is that allows us to partition the routing table. So each, when you're in a multi-tenant environment, each tenant can have essentially their own routing table. And what does that do for you? That means that I don't have to worry about having one gigantic flat routing space across all my tenants. If, if uh, dun, 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 dun. Here we go, here we go, here it is. So you can see over here I've got three tenants and they're coming over three different VLANs. They're coming over the, the common physical cross connect but their virtual circuits coming over it. They're hooking to my uh, switch in my cage. In my cage I have the VRF set up for each tenant. What can happen is that tenant A and tenant B uh, in the cloud, they can have the same IP range, uh, address range, same sitter block or they can do, have the same sitter block on-prem. The only requirement is that within a given tenancy, there be no overlap in, in sitter blocks. And this, and this is very, very helpful because, you know, you guys, you guys go out on-prem, you guys look at these guys, what do they do? They do no, 10.0.0.0 slant 8. You know, that's my on-prem IP range. <laughs> or, or they'll do something similar in the cloud. And everybody uses the same private ranges. And that's why you have to do a solution like this if you're going to do multi-tenant that accounts for sitter collisions. So the other thing that we've been doing is we've been doing a lot of flash installations in, in, in MPS. And you think, well, you know, you're already adding a millisecond or two latency. What does it matter? Not every customer needs flash. Who, what if you don't need the performance? But, but what we found is that remember, in the colo, you're paying a monthly capex charge depending on the number of racks and the amount of power draw that you're using. So what happens is by going to flash, you're far more dense and you're drawing less power and your charges in the colo are lower. So that's something to consider and something that a lot of customers see and the end, re end result is a lot of what we deploy is flash. Especially when you get 32 terabyte drives. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Especially when you get 32 terabyte drives. Yes. Oh, the so. 15 terabyte drive. Yeah, it's the 15.3s right now. Yeah, they're not so. bad, but yeah, it's not. That ought to be enough for anyone. <laughs> yeah. Didn't Bill Gates more say than you will ever that? need. Yeah, yeah, yeah 640. He swears he never said that, but I was in the room. <laughs> okay, I believe you. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> what regions are you seeing the most adoption? Which Equinix facilities or or just general? Um, initially, it was Americas, and then we had a huge pickup in, in the APAC region. But lately, the last six to nine months, EMEA is just on fire. So yeah, I was going to ask about that. I mean, I'm a big fan of MPS, but not seeing loads of adoption in the UK. I think uh, Germany, uh, mainland Europe, right. continental Europe. So we don't have, or we didn't have until recently, um, UK-based regions in Azure. Yeah, you didn't place. until they just announced the London but region. I'm not sure it's though, online right. yet, yeah. so I'd have to go look, actually. But traditionally, within the UK, um, what was the only thing, Ireland, Dublin? Yeah, there's one in Dublin, yeah. Yeah, that was all you had. Yeah. And that, that wasn't too attractive going from London to Dublin because yeah. of physics and the speed of light and latency and all that. But they do have a and London... Well, they look alike from here 
Ireland okay. and the UK are not the same country. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And yeah. one issue, like, it was, it's definitely been brought up a lot this week about the single SKU, but the issue I have with it is it never works out as far as timing for most of my customers. Mm -hmm. They'll either have gear or they'll have a direct connect or an express route somewhere, or they'll already have an Equinix contract, so they already have a piece of the puzzle. So, like I said, I was doing it before yeah. MPS was coined. Yeah. And before there was it. I don't have any MPS at all, even though we have a lot of customers doing the same thing, because of how it was assembled. Mm -hmm. So, it, what are the I numbers think, of official MPS or, or pseudo? It, it varies on how you count yeah. it. So, you know, how many of them were sold and in Salesforce they have a tag that say MPS, that's one thing. And some of them are and some of them aren't. And, and you know, you know, salesmen put whatever in, in there. You know, how was it validated by how many levers? How many of them report in ASAP? Uh, you know, yeah. you know we, ha we have all these different methods of counting and it gets really confusing uh, specifically because of that. But the, the numbers vary depending on which counting methodology you use somewhere between 200 and 1,000 customers. So it just depends on what you're counting. Like ten to twenty thousand before. Yeah. But I like how, depending on what accounting you use, there's a yeah. five <laughs> times <laughs> variation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've I've seen more. That's net some up creative. Well, I've, I've, I, I, no, it's it's not creative accounting because a lot of times, like the lower number, uh, you're using a you're using like a four vector val uh, validation. You know, like you use dual factor authentication, right? You're using four rectors that, co that coincide to validate that say that yes, that really is MPS. Uh, with the thousand number, you're using single factor authentication, right? You're just using a hit on one vector. So it just depends. And is for something like Azure, is there going to be any direct integration with that portal and MPS? Okay, so direct integration with the cloud provider's portal. It's something that has been discussed. We have an alliance team, mm -hmm. and we work with the guys. Uh, is there a project to do the, anything like that on the boards today? That I'm not aware of any. Okay. I'm not aware that the, that the cloud providers would have the motivation to do it. Does that mean it can't be done and we don't have tools that, that, could, that could be extended to integrate and do that uh, <coughs> virtual circuit provisioning and all that? No, it doesn't mean that. We already have a tool that's extensible that, that we've considered putting that, uh, that virtual circuit integration into. Not, not just the circuit, but even the object provisioning. So yes, when you have something like an MPS, you still have to rely typically today on a storage team to do things like create a LUN for you or create a share, mm -hmm. whereas the DevOp types, they don't want to know anything that runs under their VM or how it works. So they just want yeah. to press a button yeah. and throw a code so, and have things magically appear. In the DevOps so how, space. How are, they, how are we making things magically appear for yeah. them? In the DevOps space, we've done some work with integration with Perforce and now Jenkins. And we, we're working with the various um, configuration vendors, uh, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, um, to add NetApp support in. On the the uh, Windows side, we've, we've had support for years in, the, in the, what was first the Data on Tap PowerShell Toolkit, and now we call, just call it the NetApp Manageability Toolkit, which is more than just Data on Tap now, it also covers our other products. So, you know, from a scripting level, you're able to do that, and then there's a lot of work going forward with, at least on the DevOps side, with integrating with all these DevOps tools such as Perforce and Jenkins and that sort of thing. Internally within NetApp, we use uh, our own IT, we use Perforce, mm -hmm. and that integration has been done. There's actually a session here at Insight about that from the, the NetApp on NetApp, which is our yeah. internal IT folks. <clears throat> so we're, we're getting there, it's not all completely done yet, but we're, we're certainly looking at that and we're certainly working on that. Okay, when we're, in this section, we really talk about how to oper, operationalize MPS for the cloud, you know, some of the hybrid cloud use cases. Um, we talked about uh, some migrations and, and what we've really found when it comes to migration 
is there are a lot of factors. One of the most important factors is data layout. So if you're a guy that puts, you know, you stand up a VMware VM and I'm running SQL or whatever, and I throw everything on one line, mm -hmm. you're probably gonna have a horrible migration experience. If you're a guy that follows NetApp best practices for the last 12 years at least, I've been there 12 years, uh, and you segregate operating system and your, your application binaries from your data <coughs> and your logs, you're gonna have a much easier migration experience. Uh, latency, of course, you know, depending on your application, different applications have different latency requirements. Remember, how close is my colo to where the, the point of presence is for my, for the, my preferred compute com provider, you're gonna have to take that into account. And security, both virtual and physical. So. What about MPS for things like Office 365 or Salesforce or any of those? Um, where is that in the, the aspect? From an Office 365 perspective, it's more of an integration at the SAS API layer. From, we are working on it. We, ha we have a new uh, team within the newly reorganized cloud business unit so in the cloud business unit, the way we're organized is we have what's called the CAG or cloud appliance group that does like Altabalt. We have the, the group that does NetApp private storage, which is me, my boss, Jeff Eckert, is the director of that group. We have the group that does uh, on-command cloud manager, that product, um, which supports cloud on tap and could or will support MPS in the future, or might. I shouldn't use wills a little too strong, might. It's being considered. Um, we have, and they also do what's called the data fabric services like data fabric cloud sync. And then we have an additional group that does uh, SaaS application integration. And that group is newly formed. So I think it's a little early to say specifically who they're working on, but I think in terms of looking at SaaS applications and integrating with MPS or NetApp storage or cloud on tap or any form of NetApp storage, Oh, we, we specifically have a group of people that, that are uh, dedicated yeah. to that at this point. Yeah, that's something my customers have asked for quite a bit. They, yep. they want that step, but they're not just that they might be scared that their data is in the cloud, but they have requirements for governance that... Yeah, you know, if I'm using Office, Office 365 for, for email, what are my backup and archive mm -hmm. options? You know, 14 days of <laughs> deleted items or attention doesn't quite cut it. Uh, for a lot of industries and compliance requirements. Or sending classified emails. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't actually classified. work that well, yeah. does it? <laughs> so when we look at, uh, this slide really talks about how to operationalize the migration. When we look at a guy who's got VMware on-prem, or maybe, you know, maybe it's Hyper-V or maybe it's something else, but VMware is probably the most common, so we use that as an example. And he's properly segregated his data. And now he wants to move that application over to Amazon or to Azure or whoever. We used Amazon in this example. What does it take to do that? <clears throat> well, there's the actual movement of the data, right? And it might be in a VMDK on, on VMS <coughs> or a VMFS, or it might be a, a RD, uh, RDM pass through, or it could be in several different formats on one side and it's gotta be in a different format on the other side. Uh, we have tools, we have like NetApp on command shift, which is able to convert from one format to another format. Um, it supports a few formats now that's being extended to add more formats. That's good for the data. What about the boot line? What about that actual VM? That's a question I always get. I just like massive interest in doing that. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we, we worked with Microsoft a few years back to create, I don't know if you all ever saw it, but it was a pro, uh, solution called Matt for Shift that shifted from, from VMware to Hyper-V. In the process of doing that work, uh, there was a lot of discovery around, gee, this is really complicated. It's really complicated because the capabilities on one side, you know, I have four NICs and I've got three IPs per NIC and I've got this much CPU and I've got this much RAM. It's running on 
this OS on this platform with these drivers and those tools, you have to do all these pre-checks and then you have to look at the destination and then you have to look at the destination capabilities like in Azure, how many NICs can I have? One. How many IPs can I have? Two. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and you have to make sure that, that it's even possible to do it. And then if it's even possible to do it, there's all of this driver patching, tool removal, tool insertion. Uh, we know how to do this because we, we, we did this with Matt. It's just that it's incredibly, incredibly complicated. And at the end of the story, what ends up happening is that 75% of your VMs won't migrate because they've, they've failed some pre-check on requirements. It's not possible to run that exact same VM over on the other side. Uh, the two basic methods that are used today by other products in the industry to perform DR migrations to the cloud are uh, change block replication. So they replicate an image, they change the blocks, on DR, they they flip it like in Amazon. They'll do they'll do an EBS import of the v, of the VMDK. They'll flip around the drivers and the tools and everything else, and then maybe it'll come up or maybe it won't because you had fixed IP addresses. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and the other method is to is to use uh, uh, provisioning tools like Vagrant and to use a, a tool a dual provisioning scenario where you go from a common image and then you have a, you have a script which hooks Ansible or Chef or Puppet or, or desired state configuration and builds that same image in dual environments. And you know, there's, there's both ways you can do it. There's tools, there's third party tools that do it either way. Uh, my preference is dual provisioning because dual provisioning scales, whereas the change block repli uh, replication in VM import doesn't scale very well. <clears throat> so here we talk about operationalizing uh, your data layout once again, how to separate things. You, you really don't want to put everything on one line. You want to separate your OS line, you want to separate, uh, uh, especially in a, in a Linux world, the application binaries. You want to separate the, the logs and the databases. When I did the two TRs, the MPS or Oracle performance on MPS for AWS and Oracle performance for MPS on software, the environment <laughs> I built out for that used NetApp private storage. Um, I had NFS mounts for everything except for the OS binaries. I had an NFS mount where I put the Oracle binaries. I had an NFS mount where I put the Oracle databases and I had an NFS mount where I put the Oracle logs. And what happened was that when I went from testing AWS, and we, we, were, do, we were doing Oracle and we were pushing around 100,000 um, Oracle transactions <laughs> through in both TRs and in, the, in different environments, and comparing that to local compute, um, what I would do is I would just unmount and then I would mount it. So I'd mount it to local compute, I'd run the test, I'd unmount it, I'd mount it to an Amazon AMI, same OS, and I'd run the test again. <laughs> and then I would unmount it, and then I would mount it to software and do the test and unmount it and mount it to Azure and do the test and unmount it. So that's, that's really kind of uh, where you want to be with, with architecting your application data layout for mobility. It's very helpful. And once again, in this situation, I was not moving the boot line, the boot OS, of the VM itself. I was doing dual provisioning. I was provisioning the same image in multiple environments. So here we have, we have the, the question of latency. So once again, know your application, know your latency requirements. When you pick a colo um, to put your storage in, make sure it's close enough to the cloud providers that you want to use, their point of presence, that you're going to be, have a reasonable amount of latency. And you're not, you don't want to locate your, your storage in Las Vegas, Nevada, if your compute is in, is in South San Jose, California. That, that doesn't work too well. Now, the, the link you have up there, the latencies, I mean, mm -hmm. we're going on two years old for those numbers. They're the same. So we test them every year, and it, we just never updated it because we didn't change it. All we've done is when, when they put new locations online, we eventually get around to testing the new locations. <clears throat> and that's really the only thing you ever see that updates on that slide. So 
but like uh, London was brought on as a new location. We haven't tested London, London yet. There's, only, there's a very limited number of resources. We will, we just haven't got to it yet. So, and we, we talk about security and, and, okay, really this slide is about uh, some of the resources that we have around security to help you in your security requirements. This really comes into play when you're, you're handling data that has a lot of re compliance requirements, whether it's ITAR data or whether it's uh, GovCloud data or whether it's uh, HIPAA data or something to that effect. And this is really meant to throw a slide up here to give you some of the resources uh, on how to configure that. And then, again, then the last slide we have, we talk about the cloud labs. So we recently changed the URL from cloudlab.netapp.com to just cloud.netapp.com. But these, these links will still work. They all just redirect. And with that, uh, I do have a slide up that has a bunch of the key resources, uh, TRs, white papers, that sort of thing. <coughs> and thank you, unless you have any questions. <coughs>